and we are now live so hello everyone and welcome to another dental shadowers virtual shadowing session today we are joined by dr houston who is a general dentist unfortunately she's experiencing some internet issues so she'll be leaving her camera off but dr houston whenever you're ready you can go ahead and take it away all right hi everyone so my name is Dr. Erica Houston. I'm a general dentist, and I do want to thank Dental Shadowers for asking me to present today. I do love helping out pre-dental students, and I actually had a college student who was one of my patients. She shadowed me for about a week this summer, and I'll get a little bit more into my journey, but shadowing is actually what ultimately led me to my current position today, and I am a practice owner. I graduated in 2019 from Roseman Dental School, which is in Utah. It's just outside of Salt Lake City. So after school, I uh, moved back to my hometown in Arizona and I started working right away for a dentist that I had shadowed while I was in college. I purchased the practice from him last year at the end of September. And so today I thought it would be beneficial to kind of talk to you about my journey to practice ownership share share some tips and tricks with you. Um, I think these will be helpful whether or not you want to be a practice owner, um, but it's kind of geared towards becoming a practice owner. So I hope you find this interesting. Let's get started. So my senior year in high school, um, I knew that I was interested in healthcare, but I knew that I wanted to also have a family. So I was looking for a job that didn't have long hours or the need to always be on call. So I just kind of started brainstorming what I wanted to do. And I decided that being a dentist would be kind of interesting. So I decided to shadow a female dentist. I knew that she had a family. I knew that she set her own hours. She was the owner. And so I just reached out to her and asked her if I could shadow. Um, and the thing I was most nervous about was watching a dental extraction um, but that, of course, ended up being the very first procedure that I had shadowed, and I realized how much more actual finesse it took than what I had imagined in my head. And um, <laughs> later really realized the more disturbing thing that we deal with as dentists is the patient's home care and build up and plaque on their teeth versus any type of bloody procedure that you'll do. So again, I knew that I wanted to be my own boss. Um, I knew that I wanted to own my own practice, set my own hours. I liked the idea of like being able to kind of curate this workplace that I got to see how patients could have their patient flow. Um, and then also same thing with staff, um, basically just make sure that the patient experience was a fun one and that I could surround myself with people that I wanted to be with every day. So this led me to deciding that I wanted to be um, a little bit more knowledgeable about business. So I decided in college to actually major in business. And I'm not saying that you have to do this if you wanna be a practice owner, but I do think that it's beneficial to learn a little bit about business. Um, so anyways, my journey, I ended up with a biology minor and a chemistry minor, and then I majored in business. This did make it so I had an extra semester of classes and I was always taking a summer class, which by the way, I would recommend taking summer classes if you can. And it's cheaper if you can do them at community colleges. So I was able to oftentimes move home for the summer and take some at a community college and then transfer those back to my school. Some dental schools will require that you take them at your main college so that you can get your GPA and stuff like that. But if you have like other classes that you need, like English and stuff like that, and I would try to take those. It also just helps lighten your load when you're in college. Um, you guys probably know when you've got labs and all these prereqs with OCHEM and stuff like that, it can just be pretty hefty. So I found that being able to take some summer classes really lightened my load during the semester, which I really appreciated. Let's see here. So, <clears throat> so one summer I was home from school taking some uh, summer classes and I just started Googling dentists in the area because I wanted to get some shadowing hours. So 
I found this dentist who I actually had seen online on his website that he had taught at a dental school and he had previously taught at a community college here in town. So that was like a very exciting thing for me to see because I knew that he'd be interested in actually teaching. Um, so I called their office and asked them if I could come in and shadow. So his staff was really welcoming. They allowed me to do so. That first day I learned so much from him. Um, I went, I remember like going home and writing down everything that he talked to me about. Um, he talked to me about what it was like to get faster at procedures. He talked to me about how to handle patients, the staff, everything. So for me, that just like changed everything about wanting to be a dentist and what I imagined my life like. I was super intrigued and learned so much. Um, I mean, I had previously shadowed, this wasn't my shat first shadowing experience. I'd shadowed some throughout college too. Um, but you really can get so many different experiences from different people. So I would really recommend, obviously this whole group is about trying to shadow and everything. So I would recommend shadowing as much as you possibly can, watching videos like this as much as you can, because you're gonna learn at least something from all these different people. There's no offices that are run exactly the same. So to me, it was exciting to kind of get all this different information from different offices and kind of visualize where I wanted myself to be and how I wanted to make my office. Um, <clears throat> let's see, I think I talked mostly about that. So how this all kind of came full circle was when I graduated college, I got into dental school and I was kind of trying to figure out where I wanted to be. So when I was shadowing this dentist in my hometown, I didn't actually think that I would come back here and live here. Um, I just shadowed, I took it for what it was, went up to dental school. Um, my, I, my husband was trying to figure out what he wanted to do. And we started kind of like trying to figure out our five-year plan so I was kind of interested in specializing. I wasn't sure if I wanted to um, specialize in anything or if I wanted to do general dentistry. Um, so I just started brainstorming and I thought, I know I want to have a family. Um, I kind of liked living in a small town. And so I thought, I wonder if I would ever want to go back to my hometown. So um, kind of to my surprise, my husband agreed that he liked the area. My parents still live here, so that would be nice to, you know, make a family here and have them be able to help out as well. So I had kind of kept in touch with this dentist that I had shadowed. Um, we'd check in every once in a while. And so I reached out to him. I knew he'd kind of be around retirement age. So I called him up and I just asked him like, hey, how's it going? How's your practice? Do you think you'd ever sell it? I was kind of considering coming back. And he said that he actually, in fact, was looking for some buyers. And so um, that kind of opened things up. My husband and I came down here and went to dinner with him and his wife and kind of everything just like fell into place perfectly. Let me grab a drink of water. <clears throat> Alrighty, so. That was a little bit about how I got started. So let's talk now about how I became the owner. So I had planned to <clears throat> purchase the practice right out of school. Again, that dentist that I had called, he said he wanted to sell his practice. And so he had talked to his local banker who knew him and his practice really well. They told him that they would have no problem financing someone to buy the practice. So that was a green light for me. Uh, but once things started getting more serious and I started actually applying for the loan, the bank realized that I was a new graduate and that really changed things. So from the bank's perspective, they knew that the office was productive, but the productivity comes from the dentist and how quickly they can do procedures and how well treatment is being presented and accepted. And as a new graduate, you don't really have the same ability to produce as a dentist who's been practicing for many years. In this case, he had been practicing for over 30 years. 
So I was pretty devastated by this at first because I wanted to like get out of, pre out of school, buy my practice and get started. But like in hindsight, I really think that this worked out better. Being a new graduate is pretty stressful in itself. You're working under your own license now. And if you're in a busy practice, you're easily seeing like three to 10 times the amount of patients per day that you saw than you saw in dental school. And you have to think a lot more on your toes. So I think that actually having a little more time allowed me to develop better and allowed me to be less stressed. So the bank that I talked to, um, they had a, like a hard fast rule that they would only allow new grads to have a $300,000 loan. And this is just not enough to buy a well-established practice. So luckily the owner and I talked and he was willing to allow me to purchase the practice once I was able to receive the funding, which the bank had told me would be about one year. They wanted to take a look at my production numbers and make sure that I could make all the necessary payments. So we wrote this into my associate contract and um, I was lucky enough really that he was willing to work with me. <clears throat> Another thing that banks like to have is to actually have the seller carry a portion of the loan. And so what that means is the bank will lend you a portion of the total cost and that the previous owner will lend you a portion of the cost. And so you end up making payments to both the bank and the previous owner. And then if the previous owner is willing to stay on for at least a year and help you transition, that ultimately helps ensure um, the loan. And it also ensures that you'll be successful because a major thing about taking over, especially a well-established practice is that patients aren't gonna know you, they're not gonna trust you and they could easily leave. So by having a dentist who's kind of transitioning with you. When I first started, I came into every exam that he did and met the patients. Even if I didn't do their exam, I at least met them so that at their next six month appointment, if we would give them the option of which dentist they would wanna see. So this worked out really, really well for me. So ultimately the bank decided that they were gonna require the seller to carry at least 25%. Um, so, this can be kind of frustrating as a seller who a seller just kind of wants to get their money maybe and, and get out. But the benefit of it is it does kind of have them have a little bit of like skin in the game. So the seller is wanting you to be successful because you also have a loan with them. So the specific numbers when I was graduating that the bank told me that they were looking at for production was around $20,000 a month. To me now, this seems very doable. Um, it obviously depends on like what area that you work in and what your fees are. But um, when I first started trying to get patients to see me was difficult because I was a new graduate. They had been very established in this practice. So, um, that was obviously a little bit more tough to just make the amount of money that I'm producing now. So it makes sense that the banks want to look at this before they lend you the money. So it's just something that you really want to keep in mind. So again, yeah, I think it's worth, you know, working about six months to a year so that you can make sure that you're getting as many patients transitioned to you, um, you know, built like buying a practice is a huge commitment and you wanna make sure that you're gonna be able to make your payments. So I think, you know, like I talked about, I wanted to get out of dental school, buy a practice and just hit the ground running. But in hindsight, it was so helpful that I um, ended up taking a little bit longer. Um, so I would say within probably within three to four months, I was getting up to the $20,000 mark and keep in mind, this is not looking at what your hygienist or the other dentist is producing. This is strictly stuff that you are able to do. So you want to make sure you have a way of tracking this too, when you first start. Okay. 
All right, so, oh, and I included a tip here. So if you do decide that you're going to maybe slowly transition into buying a practice that you're working at, you want to decide on a purchase price before you start working there. And the reason for that is if you're buying a practice where there's one dentist and then you come in and you start producing more, now the practice is actually ultimately worth more because uh, basically you figure out what it's producing and that kind of adds to the value. So you don't wanna come in and help build the practice up to a higher value and then end up paying for that. So I would either suggest like deciding on a purchase price before you start, or at least agree that you're only going to evaluate the cost of the practice using the previous financials before you started working. All right, so I've got a few um, areas of advice here. So this is for anybody, not just anybody who wants to become a practice owner, but this could be easier said than done. Um, but I always encourage pre-dental students to really try to make connections and don't be shy. Um, honestly, I was pretty shy in college. Um, I didn't want to like go to teachers office hours and stuff because I felt like I was just too nervous or didn't want to disrupt them. But I forced myself to do it because I knew that I needed to get letters of recommendation for dental school. Um, and it, luckily I did go to a smaller college. I was able to have a lot of one-on-one -on -one interactions with professors. And the more I started doing that, the more comfortable I started getting. And, you know, ultimately too, they want you to succeed. So if they know that you're trying and you're coming into their office hours and you're studying for exams, um, they're, you know, very helpful as well. They usually kind of point you in directions of what's gonna be on the test and stuff like that. So I would really, really encourage you to just put yourself out there, go to those office hours. And, you know, another thing I would really encourage you to do, if you're going to college somewhere where you don't want to practice, maybe make some time to go somewhere where you think you could want to practice or you think you would want to live and look around at the population, look around at how many dental offices are there and see if the market is really saturated or maybe they need dentists in the area. Look for patients, I would look for even offices where there's maybe an older dentist who is the owner and maybe wanting to retire and just try to see if they would let you shadow or ask them questions. It can be a little awkward at first, but um, it really opened up a lot of doors for me um, another thing that's really interesting too, if you know that you want to be a general dentist, I would look in the area where you want to live and see if there's other specialists in the area. Because for me, I knew I wanted to live in a small town. Well, a lot of times in small towns, they don't have specialists. So you end up doing a lot of procedures that in bigger areas, some dentists will be referring out. So for example, like seeing uh, pediatric patients or doing root canals. If you don't have specialists that you can refer to, you end up doing a lot of those procedures, which can be great if you love those procedures, or it can be really challenging if you don't want to do those procedures. So I would definitely encourage you to look in the area for certain specialists. <clears throat> and this may be something that you do later on when you're in dental school, but just kind of something to think about. Um, let's see. There's tons of different ways, again, to run a different, a diff a, there's tons of ways to run a dental practice. So, you know, it's important to just get yourself out there and see how different offices are run. Dental school, you know, obviously focuses a lot on teaching you dentistry. Um, some schools I know nowadays are trying to incorporate more about the business sides of things, even maybe some insurance, but Ultimately, a lot of it's learned on the job. So I kind of wanted to touch a little bit on, on that. All right, so we kind of touched on this. Okay, so I think this might be out of order, but I'll just run through this real quick. Um, some general advice for people who want to be a practice owner is, you know, a big commitment, as I said, financially as well as emotionally. You're getting established in the community. You're getting established with a family if you have one. And you're making this commitment that you're gonna be in this location for a while. 
So other than just trying to get financing, I would really recommend working at an office for at least six months prior to trying to purchase it because you want to make sure that it's a place that you like, you want to make sure that you like the patients, maybe even the staff, you want to make sure you like the location. I grew up here, so I knew I liked the location and I had shadowed at this office actually for an entire summer. So I knew that I liked the office. Um, but again, there can be all sorts of different patients and staff that um, you may ultimately decide that you don't like it. So I'd highly recommend making sure that you like it before you decide on purchasing it. So we talked about working on production. Um, another thing you wanna work on, and I would really recommend that you hone this skill in, in school, um, in dental school is working on communicating with patients. It can be really overwhelming for patients when you tell them that they have major issues, even if it's just small things, patients really want to feel like they can trust you and that's gonna ultimately allow them to move forward with treatment. And we're gonna to touch a lot more on policies, but for me, I wished that I would have maybe worked a little bit more on thinking about office policies when I was in dental school. And just even before that, I mean, you think about how you want things to be run, um, how you want to treat your staff, all that kind of stuff. It's kind of a lot of paperwork, but ultimately, and I'll go over this, it goes into how you treat your staff, how you decide, how do you make decisions? It all comes down to the policies. All right, so um, a typical day for me as a practice owner kind of depends on how many dentists are in your practice. Um, right now, it's just me. The other dentist is on vacation. So this is a typical exam. I pulled this up from Monday. This is a typical day for me. I had 14 patients on my schedule. And these can be, this that could sound like a lot. Um, in dental school, you end up seeing like maybe four at the most. So, um, you know, one of them just wanted to discuss some loose teeth. One of them was a front filling. One was a crown that had come off. One was a scheduled extraction. Um, I had some toothaches and stuff like that. Um, ended up having like a, easy, a easier appointment of like removing sutures and stuff like that too. So um, you just want to kind of keep in mind that you're going to be seeing a lot of patients. The other thing is depending on how many hygienists you have, you can easily have 10 to 20 exams throughout your day. And you just have to get good at kind of coordinating, going from room to room. And again, we'll touch more on this in the, in the next couple slides, but having a good staff um, is, is imperative for being able to get where you wanna be, see all the patients that you wanna see. So for me, I have two hygienists, I have three assistants, and then I have two ladies in the front office. Um, one is like the main office coordinator who does all the scheduling, and the other one mostly does insurance. So she's checking on the eligibility of patients and all that stuff. And that can be overwhelming too. Insurance is a lot, and you don't get a lot of that in school. Okay, so that's a typical day. Here's some of the things that are not things that you experience every day, but they're things that as a practice owner, you've got to deal with. Um, <clears throat> so when, you know, staff calls in sick, this is where it comes in, in, in handy to have policies made. So if someone calls in sick, who are they gonna call? Are they gonna call you? Are they gonna call the office manager? If it's a hygienist, how are we gonna go about rescheduling their patients? Um, or if it's an assistant and you have too many procedures where now if you don't have an assistant, you're gonna to have to reschedule some of those patients. So it's really important that you have a good office manager and scheduler that can handle this for you. Um, and then with OSHA, um, there's a ton of resources out there for OSHA, the American Dental Association being one of them. Um, it's important to make someone an OSHA officer, and that's just someone that's going to be kind of in charge of this. And this is something that 
um, I have assigned my hygienist to do. So if there's anything that any of the staff see that they think could be better too, they'll report that to her. And then if there's anything like um, a finger prick with a needle or something like that, those types of incidents need to be reported and dealt with. So as a practice owner, you obviously have a lot of things going on. So it's nice to be able to delegate certain the tasks. So having someone to go to when that happens is very helpful just to kind of help you get through the day. <clears throat> and office drama, that can happen. <laughs> it's not something that I really considered before being a practice owner, but it's very important to have a good team dynamic for patient flow and for ultimately making it a fun work environment. So I always try my best to kind of squash the drama as soon as it comes out. I like to talk about things. I know that a lot of dentists try to like just not deal with it, kind of look the other way, but ultimately I've found that that just allows things to kind of build up and then they usually explode and, and it's just best to handle it from the beginning. Another thing that's kind of challenging um, was, was having the staff ask for raises. So this is kind of where it came in handy that I did have a business background. I was comfortable with Excel. So when some of the staff would come to me and ask for a raise, I said, let me kind of figure some stuff out. So I decided to make an entire Excel spreadsheet of all of my finances. And I highly recommend this. Um, it's just, it's nice to know exactly what's going on and know that I put that data in there. I do have a bookkeeper and an accountant and stuff like that, but just knowing the actual data is so important and it really, really, really helps you make decisions. So um, if you guys aren't comfortable with Excel, I know there's a lot of classes that you can take even online. I would definitely recommend working out Excel and a budget and stuff like that. Um, I think a lot of dentists kind of lack in this area. They don't either want to take the time or they don't have the skills to look at Excel and, and ultimately do some number crunching, but I promise you it will be worth it. And it's nice because then you're, you know what's going on with your finances. Embezzlement is a huge thing that happens in dental practices, unfortunately. So the next thing to talk about is in school, you don't really think about patients denying treatment. And in private practice, it's actually like a, it's a reality. Patients, they can't afford the treatment or if they're, you know, much older patients, they'll say, I don't even know how long I'm gonna live. I don't wanna spend all this money on my teeth. So the best thing you can do is just go over all of the risks with the patient and make sure that you're documenting it. Um, I do even have, forms that patients will sign saying that they know that I've explained the risks of not accepting treatment and I have them sign it. And I try not to be rude about this. Um, and it's just, again, it's something that I'm sharing with you because it's not something that I even really thought about before I was in this position. Um, that being said, I do have an office policy about when patients can deny x-rays. So if you're not able to actually diagnose things, you shouldn't be treating them. So some patients will just request a cleaning only and not allow you to do an exam or x-rays. Well, you can only do that for so long before it becomes such a huge liability. It's just not worth it. And then lastly on here, hiring and firing. Again, something that I just kind of struggled with as a new owner. Um, it's one of the harder things I'll say. So hiring, it takes a lot of work um, and it's hard to know who's gonna be a good fit in your office. I do recommend doing working interviews whenever possible, especially for hygienists. You can see how they communicate with patients and how well they are at cleaning their teeth and doing their job. And then firing is also very challenging. Um, but again, if you do have policies that are set up, it's gonna make it so much easier for you to make decisions. Um, you know, if you've or if you're able to look at this and say, look, this is our attendance policy and you've missed this amount of days, you can either decide to put that person on probation 
or you can decide to let them go and you can let them know why and you can reference something. So it just makes it easier to make decisions. So I think that's true with having the Excel spreadsheet and then having those office policies. Those are two things that have really helped me make a decision and feel good about that decision. And I think I touched on this just a little bit earlier, but I would start thinking now how you want to how you want to run your office. I would keep um, like a notebook and just kind of jot down th jot down some things. Or if you are shadowing and you notice there's a certain policy that you like or dislike, write that down. And then ultimately, when you become the practice owner, you have this resource already kind of made, and it's not so overwhelming. Um, I don't know if you guys have used OneNote, but that's what I ended up using, and I took notes on OneNote for everything, so it's really easy for you to kind of categorize, like I had dental notes, and then I had student loan notes, you know, all these other things, and so um, I was actually able to reference that going back to when I first was talking about different banks and, and what they would offer me. I looked back at my window and I was able to pull some of that data for the PowerPoint today. So just keeping it organized is, is definitely a recommendation. So these are other people that you're going to be hiring. And I really, really recommend, and I would not be able to do my job without these people. Um, I would recommend getting a lawyer who's a dental specific lawyer. There are tons of lawyers out there and they handle all sorts of different things, but there are ones that are de specifically dental lawyers. They know the ins and outs and they can basically save you a lot of trouble. So um, my lawyer specifically has helped me mostly with the purchase contract and then setting up an associate contract for the dentist who now works for me. Um, and then when I did, I actually bought the building recently that I let, that I um, practice in and he was able to recommend someone for being a commercial lawyer. And then you want to find an accountant. Accountants are very imperative to what we do. They help you with your taxes. Um, you're able to write off certain things as a business owner. So you really need a good accountant. I recommend one who's familiar with dentistry um, or at least the healthcare industry. And then a bookkeeper, um, you know, again, this is just someone who's going to help organize your accounts and stuff like that. This can be an in office job. So sometimes people will have their office manager be the bookkeeper. Um, for me personally, I have one that just works remotely. She can access my accounts, categorize everything, and then she works directly with the accountant. Um, but I do, again, keep my own Excel breakdown of all my costs. That way, too, when she sends me my monthly things, I can make sure that they're pretty on track because I know that what I'm doing matches with what she's doing. These are some other things I just threw in here, other merchants that you've got to kind of consider having. Um, when you're a practice owner, you've got to keep up the appearance of your building. So you want to have a landscaper and then you also want to have a handyman. Um, a lot of the dental reps actually have handymans that will come and work on your equipment. And this is really imperative. Um, it's nice to have someone that makes your website. I tried to do this myself and it was a lot of work. So I ended up outsourcing it. Um, but if you guys are confident with doing website building, absolutely, by all means, save some money and do it yourself. Um, it's really important to have an IT person, <laughs> so I'm not that techie. Um, I tried to have my computer screen on today, but I guess my internet's being a little bit weird. So it's really important if you're like, if your internet goes down, for me, that would be, again, it's going to cause your credit card to go down. It causes your system to go down. So definitely want a very good IT system available at all times. You need someone who's going to run a credit card. That's um, pretty basic and straightforward. Also, a little tip here, if you are a member of the American Dental Association, they offer um, discounts with some of the different credit card processing systems. They actually offer tons of different discounts with different vendors. So highly recommend being an American Dental Association member. And then when you're a student, you may be familiar with that. It's called ASDA. 
And then having an alarm on your building is also good. So a few ways to improve and make yourself faster, help yourself with your production, which is ultimately going to help you make more money, ultimately going to make you be able to get a loan faster, is to just stay consistent with the way that you approach an appointment. So I thought it'd be kind of interesting to kind of go over what I do and how I've been able to get faster, because if you're doing the same thing in a routine, you're not going to forget anything and you're also going to become faster. So if I am coming in for an exam, I will check the patient extra orally. And what this means is I palpate their head and neck and their cheeks and I'm looking for anything abnormal. Next, I have them open and I look inside of their mouth for anything abnormal. Then I have my assistant open up their x-rays. We go through their radiographs. We'll do a gum check health and then I check for cavities. And then I'll set the patient up and review all these findings with the patient. That's for an exam. This is going to be for a toothache. So if a patient comes in for a toothache appointment, that can really affect how the rest of your day goes or how the rest of your morning goes. I always recommend for scheduling that the patients come in with toothaches at eight o'clock and one o'clock because that's when I first start my day. I can figure out what's going on with the patient and then figure out how to schedule them that procedure that they need, see if I can work it into my morning. So basically by asking a few of the same questions, we're gonna ultimately figure out as fast as possible what's going on, what we recommend. Um, and you guys will go through a lot of like how to figure this all this out in dental school, but basically if it's something that you can work in through your day and you can get them in right away, it, it ultimately really helps your practice grow and it helps that patient feel really grateful for you if you can work them in and get them out of pain. So I try my best to always treat the patient the day that they're coming in. But if our schedule is crazy, I at least have the front office bring them in. We can figure out what's going on. I can either try to just do something temporary to get them out of pain and then get them scheduled back. But I try to provide same day treatment for them. And again, I think that's just a practice builder. It helps patients, you know, if you can get a patient out of pain, they are going to be really happy with you. They're going to tell their friends about you and it's really rewarding. And crown preparations, um, the dentist that I bought the practice from has been a great mentor and he's um, taught me a lot of how to stay consistent and how to get faster, but this was a major one when you're in dental school, you'll know, you take so long time to get better at crown preps. It can take you four hours to do your first crown prep, but you don't have that same luxury in private practice and the patients don't want to be sitting there for four hours. So if you get in the same habit of, of doing the exact same thing, using the same burrs, it just makes you faster and it makes the patients happier. So for me, this is kind of the little outline that I do. I'll cut in between, cut the top, then the sides. Then I have my assistant pack cord. And that's just basically getting the gum tissue away from the tooth. And then I can go do an exam or something like that while the assistant's doing that. I'll come back and smooth it. We'll take an impression. And then I have my assistant start the temporary. And so then at that point, I can go do another exam or get another patient numb. And then I'll come back and I'll check that temporary and I'll get it cemented. So this is just my flow. You guys will come up with your own, but it's important too to kind of best utilize your assistance so that you can be seeing other patients and making the most out of your day. So my advice to you is to be hungry, be excited, know what you want to get out of your career and your life. This can be a very overwhelming job, but it can also be very, very rewarding. And if you start visualizing what you want it to look like, I truly believe that you can make it what you want. Getting into dental school is probably the biggest stress that you can think about right now. But if you can imagine your life afterwards, you can definitely make it through dental school. That's what encouraged me to get out of my shell a little bit. Again, when I was too shy to go talk to professors or shy enough to call an office and say, hey, can I come shadow here? just picturing where I wanted myself to be, I knew that I had to take those steps to get there. So um, 
I just highly encourage you to think about life beyond dental school and what you want that to look like. So next here, I'm gonna put my Instagram is on here, but if you guys do want to um, email me, I'm always happy to answer questions. So it's actually that same username, Erica Houston DMD, it's just at gmail.com. So you can reach me via email or you can even message me on Instagram. Awesome. Thank you so much, Dr. Houston, for your presentation. I learned a lot about the business side of dentistry and practice ownership. Yes, you're welcome. I forgot to mention that I'm like, uh, let's see, I'm 37 weeks pregnant. So I was out of breath a lot of that time. So I'm sorry oh that gosh. I'm like rushing through that. I realized I was out of breath, but I was just excited. <laughs> no, no, it's okay. We really appreciate it. Those were a lot of great details. I feel like pre-dental students don't really learn about that as much. So that was great. I'm so glad to share. So Isabel will go ahead and take some questions from the YouTube live chat now. Yes, I also really enjoyed that presentation and learning about the business side. But um, so our first question is, what are the pros and cons of buying a practice versus starting your own practice? Oh, that's a great question. So, okay, I'll talk about the pros. The pros, I would say, is that there is an established patient base. So there's patients, for me in my scenario, this office has been here, um, let's see, since the 80s. So there, people are familiar with this location. People have driven by this for 40 years. They've seen the sign that says dentistry. Um, and then the owner that I bought it from has been, has been here for 30 years. So there's patients that have literally grown up with him. They've brought their families in and their kids are now patients here. And so there's a huge establishment of patients that are already here. The second thing is having a staff that's already established. So, I mean, I guess that could be also a bad thing, but for, for me, all of the staff that he previously have and that I haven't had to hire have been awesome. There's three people that have been here over 10 years. So they are, they know the patients too. So the patients feel comfortable with the staff. They know the friendly face at the front. They know the assistants and then when you're not in the room and they say like, oh, you know, who's Dr. Houston? Do you trust her? Then, you know, having the assistant say, you know, and you have to establish this rapport with them as well, but having them know the patients, um, I think is huge, a huge plus. Um, those are like two that I have felt are huge pros. Um, and then, for, I guess for a con, you could kind of see that in the other way is you, it's harder to shape the practice maybe in the vision that you have. I don't think it's impossible, but um, there's patients here that have said to me, I've been coming here for 30 years and this is the way that it was, or, you know, they, they aren't happy with certain things that I've brought in. That's very, very rare. Um, there's not a lot of those. And one of those things was just basically um, not allowing patients to go longer than two years without x-rays. Um, so it's ultimately something that's going to help the patient, but they just didn't want that. They wanted a cleaning only. And um, they were like, this is how I've done it forever, you know? So that's probably one of the cons. Um, but yeah, I think there's a lot more pros than cons. I think that it's intriguing to want to start your own practice, but it's a lot more work, I will say. That makes sense, thank you. Um, my next question is, what is OSHA, O-S-H-A? Oh, it stands for, it's like Occupational Safety Hazard. Let's see, I'll have to look it up because I don't remember. Occupational Safety and Health Administration. So it's basically like being safe in the workplace and that's everywhere. Um, they're gonna have OSHA standards, but when you're working in the dental field, there's like blood and saliva and contagious diseases and stuff like that. So there's a lot of rules and regulations. And so um, again, the American Dental Association has a lot of good resources for having policies for how to um, basically you have to have like 
you know, if you guys are in labs and stuff like that, you're familiar with eye wash stations, you have to have certain eye wash stations available. You have to have an outline of what happens if someone does have an eye exposure to saliva or blood, or if someone pokes themselves with a needle and stuff like that, or an instrument. Um, so again, just having like someone called an OSHA officer in your, in your office that incidents can be reported to and then reported back to you, it just kind of helps delegate everything so that you're not, if you're in the middle of something that it's still being handled. Thank you. Um, did you ever make a business plan? And if so, when did you start working on it before presenting it to the bank? I did not make a specific plan, um, but I did. Actually, I, I wonder if you guys have access, I could send you a document that the bank did send to me um, about just kind of like getting an idea of like how you want to run things and how you want to have your business. Um, I don't think that they required me to have one, but even in school, um, actually we did have to put together a little thing. And so I spent a little bit of time thinking about it, but I didn't make like an official one. Um, the next question is, how did you learn about insurance? Oh, <laughs> during COVID. <laughs> so um, basically, let's see, so like March, we had to shut down. You guys might be familiar with this offices. Um, had to shut down for emergency treatments only. So I was coming in to the office and seeing a few patients here and there, but um, I took this time to learn about insurance. I watched a lot of YouTube videos and there are a lot of Facebook groups too about, um, depending on what dental software you have. Um, the one that I have is called EagleSoft. And I know some schools use that, but there's, Great, great, great Facebook resources. Um, I'm trying to think of what, I think one of them's called like um, Front Office Rocks and there's one called Andre's Eagle Soft Guide, tons of YouTube videos. Um, and then basically just looking through the insurance checks. So the insurance will send you a breakdown of what they're paying you for and you put that into the computer, into your software system. So. I just went through all of those checks and saw like what the insurance was paying. And uh, my office manager helped me a lot with that too. So I think that's a huge skill to have is being able to input those insurance checks and know like what you're writing off and how much that is. And it's a little bit shocking. Sometimes I wish that I didn't look at them because insurances are not paying you back as much as as you'd hope for, um, but you know, it's, it's a way that you get patients and it's a way for patients to be able to afford treatment. So it's nice to have, but um, it is a time consuming thing. And the best time that I had was when we were closed for COVID. So that was helpful for me. Um, but I will say as a business owner, <laughs> you like don't work normal hours. You know, I see patients eight to five um, I was seeing patients Monday through Friday, eight to five, but I've recently started doing eight to noon on Fridays. And that just kind of provided me with this afternoon time to do things like this and also um, get caught up with all sorts of paperwork that you have as a practice owner. But a typical day, I will stay at the office until about six or 6.30, checking patient charts and notes and looking at anything else throughout the day that I've got to look at. So um, you do have to put in a lot more time, uh, but for me, it's worth it. Uh, we have one person asking for the crown preps. Do you mind elaborating on the first and few steps, um, like the part about cutting in between the sides and the top? <laughs> yeah, sure. I know I kind of flew through that. Um, so when a patient needs to have a crown done, what that means, um, if you're not familiar with that, is somehow the crown, that somehow the tooth is kind of compromised. So, if the tooth has needed to have a root canal, for example, that's where we remove the nerve of the tooth, and the tooth has to be covered all the way around. Um, so, think of like a, a cap 
or a hat, it's gonna go over the entire tooth. So you have to reduce the tooth in order for a material to go over the tooth that's not gonna be bigger than the original. So you're gonna be basically cutting 360 of the tooth. So you're cutting in between the tooth, you're cutting the top of it, and then 360 degrees around the axial walls you're gonna be cutting. So that basically each cut that you have to do, just having a consistent way that you do that is gonna make you faster. And so for me too, I also use different burrs. Burrs are the little pieces that you cut with. And so there's specific ones. If you're cutting in between the tooth, you obviously wanna use like a very skinny one so that you're not cutting the other teeth. And then for the top one, there's certain burrs that have like a certain depth that you can just cut through without going any deeper than you need to. Um, and so I have different burrs at each of those steps as well. Um, and that's something you would learn in dental school, right? Yes. Um, you would learn how to cut it, um, but I would recommend when you're learning it to learn a certain pattern that you do every time so that that makes you faster and more consistent. That makes sense. Um, and we have a couple more questions before we end. Of what course. are you looking for when hiring employees in terms of skills and characteristics? Oh, good question. Um, it depends on the position. So um, in general, you want someone who is a team player. It's hard to work with people who are really independent and don't work well with other people because especially if you are running behind, it's nice to have the type of person who will just jump in and help out. Even if that person doesn't normally, let's say they don't normally like take out the trash, they don't normally flip a room for you and clean the room, having someone that's not opposed to doing that is huge. So a team player is a great skill to have. Um, and then for like assistants and hygienists specifically, I would say people who are good at communication. Um, so a lot of times if I have a treatment plan for a patient and I go over that treatment plan with them, then they have more questions and I left the room, then they're going to ask the assistant. So having the assistant have very knowledgeable you know, just having them understand dentistry and why certain things are being done. And this comes down to how you train your assistants too. So um, it, that, that a lot of it depends on how you're training them too. Um, but I would say someone who is just good at communication, if they're a good communicator, you can teach them about dentistry, then they can be making sure that they're explaining everything to the patient in a useful way. Um, and hygienists too, they, they're gonna be cleaning the patient's teeth. So you wanna have them be able to communicate with their patient, like why they're doing the certain treatment. And you really just want like personable people. I mean, I don't know how you guys feel about going to the dentist. It's never been one of my favorite things. You're gonna be like in this person's bubble and in their space. So just someone who is like compassionate, empathetic, and um, I feel like gentle is a good skill to have as well. Um, and then as far as like front office people, you want people who are very driven. Um, there's a lot of stuff that has to be done. And so if you have to be, if you have to oversee everything and like specifically tell this person what you expect, it makes it a lot harder than if this person comes to you and says, hey, this is what's going on, here's my solution. So having like solution driven people who know how to handle things too, that's huge. That just ultimately saves you time too because if they're like, hey, this was the problem, here's how I fixed it, or here's, how, here's what I propose that we do, um, it makes it a lot easier for you. That makes a lot of sense. Thank you for all the great advice. I think that is time. Okay. Well, I hope awesome. I answered everyone's questions. And again, if people have more questions, seriously, feel free to message me on Instagram. I love helping people. And um, being a new grad, you know, I've only been out two years. I got a soft spot in my heart for all of you guys. And I want the dental profession and the dental career to 
be successful. I also um, love being a practice owner because it makes it more uh, community based. I feel there, you guys probably are familiar with like DSOs and more corporately run dental practices. And in my opinion, those are not the best way for patients to get treatment. There's a lot of treatment that may not be necessary, but if you've got this corporation, they're pushing a lot more stuff. And so um, if anyone is curious about opening their own practice, I highly, highly encourage it and would love to help in any way I can. Awesome. Thank you so much, Dr. Houston. I really appreciate your time. And I hope everyone has a great day. Bye, everyone. Bye.